this test, you will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. In the IELTS listening test, the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a male student talking to a union representative about placing an advertisement to sell a laptop. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hi, I'm Debbie. How can I help? Hi, my name's David. I'm just looking to place an advertisement on the main union notice board to sell a laptop and a few accessories if that's possible. The answer is advertisement. So, advertisement has been written in the space. Now the test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi, I'm Debbie. How can I help? Hi, my name's David. I'm just looking to place an advertisement on the main union notice board to sell a laptop and a few accessories if that's possible. Sure, that's not a problem. I take it you are a member of the Students' Union? Yes, I am. Right then. I'll just get a form up. And as there is no one around, and it looks as if it's going to be quiet for a while, I'll just type the details straight into the computer for you. Thanks very much. No problem. Shall we just title it Laptop for Sale? Yeah, OK. Can you describe it generally? Well, it's in very good condition. In fact, it's hardly been used. Why are you selling it, if I may ask? Well, I've got another one which is much lighter and I don't really need two. I see. What weight is the one you're selling? It's uh, 3.5 kilograms. That is heavy these days. Can you give more details about the one you want to sell? Right. Uh, well, it's an Allegro and it's got all the latest programs. OK. What about the memory? The memory is only 0.5 gigabytes. And what about the screen size and the other features? Oh, well, uh, the, uh, the screen is, well, let's see, it's 37.5 uh, centimetres with a standard size keyboard and a touchpad. But I've got a cordless mouse that I can put in with it if necessary. Well, some people don't like using a touchpad. What about ports or holes for attaching things to the laptop? It's got two ports. Mm. More modern laptops have more than two ports for all the extra attachments. They do. Uh, let's see, uh, what else is important? Uh, oh yeah, the, uh, the battery lasts for two and a half hours, which is okay, but not enough for long train journeys. Uh, but one thing is that it's not wireless. Right, okay, not wireless. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Anything else I can put on the advertisement? There's a webcam built at the top of the screen and uh, I can throw in a printer, a scanner and headphones, which I, I got with it in a special deal. 
It also comes with its own case for carrying it around. Actually, the case is quite smart. I'm hoping these things will help it sell. They should do. Right, I think I've got all that. How much do you want for it? That, I'm not sure about. Uh, it's worth about £900 to £1,000 new. Yeah, but you won't get that much if it's used, and even if it's in good condition. What about £500? I doubt if you'd get as much as that. More like £200 or £300. If you look at the notice board, there is one on there which is comparable to yours, and it's not more than about £250, I think. As little as that? I'm afraid so. Shall we say £300? OK, put that. Can I take some contact details for the advert? The name's David Bristow. B-R-I-S-T-O-W. Yes, that's it. And uh, a mobile or email? Both, if you want. It's D-I-B underscore 7791 at hotmail.com. OK. And the mobile? Uh, that's 09875 423387. That's it. If you send the picture, I'll add it and print it out and stick it up for you. OK. I can get that to you today. Right. I'll type in here, Advert placed the 22nd of October. Fine. And good luck with the sale. Thanks. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Test 1, Section 2. You will hear an accommodation officer telling students about different halls of residence. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 11 to 15. Good afternoon, and welcome to Stanton University. I'm here to tell you about the various halls of residence we have available, should you choose to come here. We aim to offer accommodation in halls to all first-year students, and you'll find there's a good variety to choose from. First of all, there's Brown Hall, which, as you'll see, is not the most modern of buildings, but it is very popular with some students. It's got a good sense of community, some nice refurbished kitchens, and unlike the other halls, it has recently had a gym built in its basement. Another option is Blake Residence, which is built like a large house, and so everybody cooks and eats together. It has its own sectioned-off bit of private garden, and is even more peaceful because this is an all-girls residence. Although, of course, boys are allowed to visit the hall, and, uh, I understand, frequently take part in cooking dinner. The largest hall we have is Queen's Building, and this has been upgraded recently. The original parking area has been built on so that the hall now has a large common room, and each bedroom now has its own shower room, which many students regard as a real bonus. A further option is the Parkway Flats, which won an award for design in its day. And this building now has a preservation order on it. This has meant that only a limited amount could be done to upgrade it, and the surrounding area is important, so parking is not permitted around the flats. 
However, the flats do have many extra facilities, such as a special computer room, a small library, and a self-service restaurant. The cost of breakfast, lunch, and dinner is covered in the fees for this hall, so it does look a bit more expensive. The last residence we can offer you is Temple Rise, which again is slightly more expensive than other halls as the rooms are larger. This has got very lovely views across to the coast, and this more than compensates for the fact that bathrooms here are shared between six students. However, the hall has domestic staff who clean the rooms once a week, so this is perhaps an attractive option for the messier amongst you. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 16 to 20. Now, if I can just show on this wall map here where they all are, uh, you might like to go and have a look round. If you come into the main university entrance, at the first junction, you'll find that Brown Hall is on the corner opposite the theatre. So you're nice and near the station here, though I think it can get a bit noisy with traffic. The same applies to Blake Residence, which is directly facing the junction to the university entrance. These halls are often used by medical students and such like, as they're out all day, so don't notice the noise. Anyway, if you then walk along Campus Road towards the main circle, you'll see the library on the corner, and Queen's Building is just past that as you head north. You will find that it is quieter here, and you may get fewer visitors. By the way, the circle is quite a feature of the campus, as it's set into the hills and has a brand new sports centre in the middle. It's worth going to look around it. Now, the Parkway Flats are on the opposite corner to the library, facing the circle, as you head towards the main buildings. The main buildings are only about a five-minute walk from here, and places in these halls go quickly, so my advice is to reserve your place as soon as possible. Then, Temple Rise is inside the circle, next to the sports centre, but further from the main university buildings. Now, if you'd like to go off and physically... Section 3. You will hear a discussion between a business student called Marco and his personal tutor about the courses that Marco should take. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23 on page 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Hi, Marco. Come in. Thanks. I've got a bit stuck trying to select courses for next semester. Could you help me, please? Of course. Sit down. Oh. First of all, most people just go for the areas of business that they're interested in. But even if something doesn't look very stimulating, it's important that you can use it once you get a job. It's not much good choosing areas that aren't going to be helpful later on. Right. I want to go into management, so I'll need to think about that. And should I start specialising in a particular area yet? 
I don't think that's wise at this stage. It's better to aim for a wide variety of subjects, especially as management covers so many possibilities. You shouldn't be limiting your choices for later on. Yes, I see. You should also look at how the course is made up. Will you have regular seminars and tutorials, for example, as well as lectures? OK. Some of the lecturers are quite big names in their fields, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Should I aim to go to their courses? Well, remember that the lecturers who aren't well-known may still be very good teachers. I'd say we have a consistently high standard of teaching in this department, so you don't need to worry about it. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30 on pages 5 and 6. Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. Good. Well, that's a great help. Now, last time we met, you mentioned doing team management, didn't you? That's right. I'm still quite keen on the idea. Mm -hmm. The trouble is that because of changes in the content of various courses, team management overlaps with the Introduction to Management course you took in your first year. Oh. So what you'd learn from it would be too little for the amount of time you'd have to spend on it. I'll drop that idea then. Have you had a chance to look at the outline I wrote for my finance dissertation? I left it in your pigeonhole last week. Yes. Why exactly do you want to write a dissertation instead of taking the finance modules? It'll be pretty demanding. Well, I'm quite prepared to do the extra work because I'm keen to investigate something in depth instead of just skating across the surface. I realise that a broader knowledge base may be more useful to my career, but I'm really keen to do this. Hmm, right. Well, I had a quick look through your outline, and the first thing that struck me was that you'll have to be careful how you set about it, as the way you've organised it seems unnecessarily complex. The data that you want to collect and analyse is potentially valuable, but you'll need to narrow down the subject matter to make the whole thing manageable. OK. I'll have another look at it. I was talking to Professor Briggs about it yesterday, and I got some more ideas then. For part of the dissertation, I was thinking of trying to persuade finance managers from three or four companies to let me ask them about their company finances. Mm -hmm. If not, I think I'll have to change to another topic. Well, go ahead then. I could give you some names. Thanks. Now, let's talk about practicalities. Your dissertation must be finalised by the end of May, so you should aim to finish the first draft by the end of March. Is that feasible? Yes, it shouldn't be a problem. I'll need to register for the dissertation, won't I? Is that with the registrar's department? No, it's internal to this department, so you just need to let the secretary know. Do that as soon as you're sure you're going to write the dissertation. OK. Then, to analyse your statistics, you're going to need some suitable software. If I were you, I'd drop into the computer office and ask them for a copy. Right. So, if I revise my outline... Can... That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a talk on the research of the behaviour of chimpanzees. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome back to my series of short lectures on apes. Today we will examine recent and historical breakthroughs on the behaviour of chimpanzees, otherwise known as chimps. The word chimpanzee is an umbrella term for two different species of apes in the genus Pan, which are the common chimpanzee or pan troglodytes, found in West and Central Africa, and the bonobo, or pan paniscus, which are found in the forests of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Chimpanzees belong to the hominidae family, together with gorillas, orangutans, and indeed humans. Current research tells us that the chimps broke away from the human branch of the hominidae family approximately six million years ago and remain the closest living relative to humans to this day. More modern researchers into chimpanzees have centred on their behavioural characteristics, once all biological and genetic factors have been ruled out. In this way, scientists have unearthed an unfathomable amount of similarities between human and chimpanzee behaviour. Although much of this research has taken place through observation of captive chimps, the results are widely seen as an authoritative reflection of chimps living in the wild. Chimps live in large so-called communities, comprised of many male and female members, with the social hierarchy determined by an individual chimp's position and influence. Through such research, scientists have found that chimps learn and adapt through observation of others' behaviour. Once in power, the alpha male is often seen to alter its body language in order to retain power. For example, he might puff himself up in order to intimidate others. While lower-ranking chimps are noted to behave more submissively and holding out their hands while grunting. Female chimpanzees also have a distinct social hierarchy, with high social standing inherited by children. It is not unheard of for dominant females within a community to unite and overthrow the alpha male, backing another in his place. James Diamond, in his book The Third Chimpanzee, suggests that chimps should now be reclassified in the genus Homo instead of Pan, and there are many arguments still in favour of this. Male common chimpanzees are, on average, 1.7 metres in height, weighing 70 kilograms, with their female counterparts being somewhat smaller. By comparison, the bonobo is slightly shorter and lighter, but with longer arms and legs. However, both species walk on all fours and climb trees with great ease. Jane Goodall made a groundbreaking discovery in 1960 when she observed the use of tools among chimpanzees including digging for termites with large sticks. A recent study claimed to reveal that common chimpanzees in Senegal have been using spears sharpened with their teeth to hunt. However, these reports remain unsubstantiated. Researchers have witnessed such tools, namely rocks, being used by chimps to open coconut shells and indeed crushing nuts with stone hammers. As scientific technology has developed, so too has our knowledge of the sheer extent of the chimps' intelligence. Research has now shown that chimps have the capability to learn and use symbols.
and understand aspects of the human language, including syntax, as well as numerical sequences. As I mentioned earlier, the umbrella term chimpanzee is comprised of the common chimpanzee and the bonobo. These two subspecies are divided along the Congo River, with the common chimps living on one side and the bonobos living on the opposite side of the river. Over the past few decades, both of these subspecies have witnessed an alarming decrease in population density, with animal activists now working harder than ever to protect those remaining and encourage procreation. In addition, next week's episode will focus more closely on how chimpanzees in captivity are able to learn things through imitating the behaviour of humans, as well as how chimpanzees' behaviours have developed over many generations. Thank you very much for attending this evening's lecture. I hope you found it intellectually stimulating, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Good night. That is the end of section four. You now have.